Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. A young man had an accident while driving his car. The car was expensive and spectacular. When a policeman arrived, he found the young man standing near the car mumbling. As the officer approached to make sure he was okay, he overheard the young man saying, Oh no, my BMW. Oh, my BMW. Looking at the young man, the policeman said, Are you crazy? Look at the condition of your arm. Your left arm is all mangled. The young man looked down and said, Oh no, my Rolex. Oh, my Rolex. For many, their possessions and money mean the world to them. In a recent survey of over 200,000 college freshmen, 76% listed financial prosperity as the most important of their life goals. In almost every presidential election, one of the top issues is the economy. To many, their top voting priority is their buying power, even more important than crime, foreign policy, or moral values. When I began Bible school, I was surprised to hear about a number of prospective students who wanted to go into the ministry, but they were talked out of it by their parents because the ministry did not pay enough. We need to be careful that we do not buy into the world's short-sighted mindset that life consists of financial prosperity and the things that we possess. The rich young ruler loved his riches and possessions and refused to let them go. We'll see how the Lord shook the foundation of the rich young ruler and shook him to his core with the one thing that he lacked in order to have everlasting life. Mark 10, 17 reads, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? The Lord was traveling here. He was going forth into the way, verse 17 says. Verse 1 tells us that they were currently near the region of Judea and Perea on the east side of the Jordan River. Verse 32 teaches us where they were going. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem. This is the journey of the Lord to Jerusalem for the Passover, which ended with his crucifixion, death, and resurrection. As they were traveling to Jerusalem, there came one running, it says, and that there came one running shows us that he came alone. Matthew 19.22 describes him as a young man. Luke 18 tells us that he was a certain ruler. But we don't know for certain what he was a ruler of. In Luke 8, the Lord raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Jairus was called a ruler of the synagogue. So perhaps this young man was also a ruler in his local synagogue. As the Lord was traveling, hearing that he was nearby, this wealthy, influential young man came with a full sprint to meet the Lord before he left his community. There was an earnest, fervent desire in this young man's heart for spiritual things, which led him to run to the Lord. To the Lord. And then when he got to him, he knelt at his feet. Kneeling before the Lord depicts an act of profound respect. By this posture, the young man was acknowledging the superiority and authority of the Lord. He approached the Lord here with sincerity to eager, eagerly and earnestly ask him his question. In addition, he addressed Christ as good master. Master means teacher. Addressing him as good teacher expressed his great admiration for the Lord as one who could give him spiritual guidance and an authoritative answer that he so greatly needed. And he asks the Lord the question, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And that's the most important question anyone could ask, even now. To ask this question, the rich young ruler obviously either felt insecure about his eternal life or he believed he did not possess it. 
the question in itself is remarkable because many Jews in that day believed that they had eternal life simply because they were the children of Abraham. But this young man obviously did not believe that. He wanted to know what he should do to secure eternal life. The meaning of the verb do in the original Greek implies the achievement of some great exploit, which he desired for Christ to point out to him that would assure him of his eternal life. Eternal life is equated by the Lord later in verse 15 with the kingdom of God. The young man wanted assurance of inheriting or possessing eternal life within the messianic kingdom to be established on the earth. And he, this young man wanted to know how to enter the kingdom. And this was Israel's hope. The eternal life, though, that we possess in Christ under grace doesn't give us a home in the kingdom on earth. It gives us a home in heaven forever because this is the hope for the body of Christ. The hope of heaven was not on this young man's mind. Eternal life and entrance into the eternal earthly kingdom was what he was asking about. Mark 10, 18 to 20 reads, And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. With the young man kneeling on the ground before him, sincerely asking his question, the Lord seized on the words, good teacher. He did not refuse the title. He was the good teacher. To talk about eternal life, though, they needed to talk about the identity of Christ. The young man's view of Christ fell short of all that he is. He is a good teacher, but he is much more than just a good teacher. The terms of salvation under the gospel of the kingdom were tied to the person of Jesus Christ and faith in who he is. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all focus in on that. The gospels show how the Lord fulfilled prophecy and performed miracles which all demonstrated the truth that he is Israel's Messiah. His authority over nature, the supernatural realm, and the grave all showed that he is God Almighty as well. You find throughout the Gospels the debate that raged in Israel's division over the identity of the Lord. Some said he was a prophet, others Elijah, some thought he was Jeremiah, and others thought he was John the Baptist. To have eternal life, they needed to place their faith in him, in who he was, as Israel's Messiah and the Son of God. When Thomas saw the Lord after he had risen, he declared to him, My Lord and my God. Israel needed to believe that to be saved. Next, in Caesarea Philippi, the Lord asked his disciples, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Lord said he would build his church on that truth, on Christ, the Son of the living God, the truth of Peter's confession of who Christ really is. John recorded about his entire gospel record that it was written for this purpose. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Believing ye might have life through his name. So when the rich young ruler asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The Lord's first response went right to his identity. He was pointing out that his faith did not reach to the point that it needed. The Lord used the man's address of him as good to test his faith in him. Was the rich man willing to confess the Lord as God? Christ declared his deity by his response. He tells the young man that he called him good. Why do you call me good? There is none good but one that is God. He was saying that only God is good, intrinsically good, holy and perfect in his nature as God. Do you accept this implication in calling me good? 
do you believe that I am God, is what he was asking him. That was the first answer to the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Then the Lord goes to the next step under the time and program in which he ministered. Galatians 4.4 4 says, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. Christ lived and ministered under the law. The Lord's next answer to him, as Matthew records it, was, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Christ required law obedience in observance of it as requirement to enter into his kingdom. Deuteronomy 30, 15 to 16, thought that it taught that if a person kept the Mosaic law, he would live. And it reads, See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live. The young man asked the Lord what he needed to do, and the Lord reminds him that Israel had something to do. She was required to keep the commandments by faith to enter into life. Of course, no one could merit eternal life through keeping the law, and all fell short of keeping it perfectly. It was their faith that saved them. In doing what the law required and bringing the proper sacrifices, God granted forgiveness and life on the basis of their response of faith as they did his revealed will in keeping the law. The Lord reminds the rich young ruler of five of the Ten Commandments. First, Commandment 7, do not commit adultery. Commandment 6, do not kill. Commandment 8, do not steal. Commandment 9, do not bear false witness. Commandment 5, honor thy father and mother. Lord, the Lord quotes from the commandments that deal with man's relationship with his fellow men. These commands are easily verifiable in conduct. The young man replied, and he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. He was a young man and said he had observed all these things from his youth. So it hadn't been for very long that he had done them all. And this reminds me when our children were young, around eight or ten years old or so, how they would remember doing something in the past and they'd say, back when I was little. But notice how the young man, though, here, it's important to notice this. They, he dropped the word good. The second time he just called the Lord master or teacher this time. The Lord had asked him why he called him good, because there is none good but God. Christ was stating his deity and seeing if the young man believed in him as God. Here by the young man's uh, second address to the Lord, we see that the rich young ruler did not believe that Jesus Christ is God. He also believed sincerely, I think, that he kept the commandments throughout his life. But as the Lord pointed out in his earthly ministry, the law required an inner obedience in the heart as well, not just external conformity. The Lord's going step by step here, answering this young man's question about how he could in inherit eternal life. First, he needed to believe who Christ was as God. Second, he needed to keep the commandments by faith. And then he gets to the third thing, which hits the rich young ruler right in the heart. Mark 10, 21 to 22 reads, Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Verse 21 begins with something wonderful to think about. And Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Just imagine that searching, penetrating look. He looked at this young man. He saw his sincerity. He saw his hope. And the Lord loved him. The Lord loves every single person. When the Lord looks at you, when he looks at me, he looks on us with love though we do not deserve it. 
He wants us to be saved. He wants us to have eternal life, just like he wanted this young man to have eternal life. He looked on this young man, he saw his deep need for life and salvation, and he loved him. That's why he came to this world, to pay the price for every person's sin so that anyone can be saved and have eternal life. He looked at each of us with love. After the young man said that he had kept all those five commandments, the Lord said, one thing thou lackest. And that one thing was, go, sell all, give, and follow me. That one thing could be tied up into, seek ye first the kingdom of God to have eternal life. That one thing was another commandment in the law of the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Wealth is a god to many. Many sacrifice for it, many live for it, and many worship it. Now this passage is often spiritualized, changed slightly, explained a way that it doesn't mean exactly this, or that he didn't mean that he had to sell all or everything. But when we rightly divide the word of truth, we can allow passages such as this to just speak to us as they are and be interpreted literally. The Lord meant what he said, and he said what he meant. To have eternal life under the terms of the gospel of the kingdom, they needed to do exactly what the Lord said. Sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. Right after telling the rich young ruler this, in Matthew's version of this account, it says, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all, and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And the Lord answered, And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Just like what the rich young ruler is asking about here. The Lord's disciples had forsaken all their earthly possessions to follow the Lord, and they inherited everlasting life. In Matthew 13, the Lord told a parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. That one valuable pearl is Jesus Christ. To get Christ under the kingdom program here, a man had to sell all that he had. And to have Christ is to have eternal life. In Luke 12, the Lord told the little flock, the fledgling kingdom church, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that you have and give alms. In Luke 16, where the Lord told the account of the rich man and the beggar Lazarus, after they both died, the rich man went to Hades because he had not complied with the kingdom gospel. The poor man, Lazarus, was in paradise in Abraham's bosom. After the cross, at Pentecost, believers sold all their possessions. Acts 2, 44 to 45, And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. After Pentecost, the kingdom church continued to sell all that they had. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. In Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead by the Holy Spirit because they had lied and kept back part of the money 
from the sale of their land. It shows that they were not saved because they had not given it all. James 2, 5 reads, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? All of these things teach us that a requirement to be saved and have eternal life under the terms of the gospel of the kingdom in the past was to sell all that they had, give to the poor, and follow Christ. You see by that that the Lord didn't call for a half-hearted partial commitment. He asked for everything. And he asked for everything from the rich young ruler. He wanted them to sell everything he had, give all of it to the poor. The Lord also says that he needed to take up his cross and follow him. And remember where Christ is going here. Christ is on his way to Jerusalem, to his cross. Christ is telling the rich young ruler that in following him, he needed to be willing, like him, to face suffering and death and take up his cross and lose everything, even his life. Hearing this from the Lord and not hearing what he was expecting to hear. And because he loved his riches, it says about the young man, he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. Like a skilled surgeon's knife, the Lord's words could have separated the man's heart from his riches, but he would not. He would not sell all that he had to have eternal life. He was sad. He was disappointed. He was full of sorrow and grief at the thought of this requirement. He had great possessions, it says, which likely entailed estates, lands, houses, and money. They had a grip on him to the point that he preferred those temporal things over eternal life and treasure in the kingdom of heaven. And he would not give them up, and he left in silence. It's been said well that he wanted God, but not at the cost of his gold. He wanted life, but not at the expense of his luxury. He was willing to serve, but not to sacrifice. The rich young ruler's wealth brought him sorrow instead of joy. If he had sold all that he had and had been given eternal life in Christ, he would have had joy instead of grief. And this is the only time in the Gospels when someone called to follow Christ did not do so. It is also the only time when someone is said to have gone away from the Lord's presence sad. Mark 10, 23 to 25 says, And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again, and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. The Lord points out to his disciples how hardly or how hard it is with what difficulty it is for those with riches to enter into the kingdom of God on earth. The disciples were stunned by these words, so the Lord says it again. How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? The Lord said that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. The camel was the largest beast of burden in Palestine, the needle Christ referred to was a common sewing needle. Just like a camel going through the eye of a needle is impossible, so under the terms of the gospel of the kingdom was it impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom because they were required to sell all that they had to have eternal life. Acts 16, 30 to 31 says, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. 
This passage gives a very different answer to the question of how we are saved and receive eternal life. We are now not under the law. We are under grace. And God's terms of salvation have changed under grace. The answer under grace is not what the Lord said to the rich young ruler, but what Paul said to the Philippian jailer. What must I do to be saved? The answer is just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is do absolutely nothing. Salvation is by faith alone in Christ. Under grace, we are not required to keep the commandments by faith to inherit eternal life. Under grace, we are not required to sell all our worldly possessions, give to the poor, take up the cross, and follow the Lord to have everlasting life. The rich, the poor, and everyone in between can be saved by faith alone in Christ. Under grace, we receive eternal life by grace through faith, not of works, by simply trusting that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. When we make that decision to trust Christ alone, we receive eternal life as a free gift. As Romans 6.23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And there's also nothing wrong with being rich in this dispensation of grace. The Lord has instruction for our money and those that are rich in this age, such as 1 Timothy 6.18, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate or share. And finally, the rich young ruler teaches us a principle about not allowing possessions or wealth to keep us from following the Lord. The pursuit of temporary wealth is deceitful. It seems to hold out and promise security and happiness, but it only leads to disappointment and emptiness. It can become an idol and lead us away from the Lord. But when we set our affection on things above and we live for the Lord and we serve others by His love, when we grow in His Word and we look for His coming continually, we find true riches, true blessing, joy and meaning for our life and our lives will be transformed by grace. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God for more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.